Well, good morning, everyone, and an official welcome to worship today. And I just want to say that whether you're here in person or you're watching online, I want to wish you a happy 4th of July, 4th of July weekend. It doesn't happen on Sunday very often, and so we're celebrating today, and uh, praise God. The United States is 245 years old today. On that original day of celebration, the Declaration of Independence, you know, it outlined the rights of all people, that we are created equal under God. It was a radical statement at the time that ordinary people were in any way comparable to royalty or the wealthy. The Constitution that followed was written with the intention of putting biblical principles into practice. For example, not forcing a certain religion on people, but allowing liberty and freedom for each person to worship God as they felt called to do. The founders firmly believed that America could only survive if it followed a moral compass based on God's word. Patrick Henry wrote, the great pillars of all government and of social life are virtue, morality, and religion. This is the armor and this alone that renders us invincible. If this is true, then we may not be so invincible as a nation today. Virtue, morality, and religion are in decline. We have caved to relativism, which says that each of us can determine what is right and wrong, what is moral and immoral, what is true and false. The events of this past year are an illustration of this slippery slope that we are on as a nation. And now, rather than the traditional understanding that our nation was established for religious freedom and opportunity, there are some suggesting that our founding was all about perpetuating slavery and white supremacy. Don't buy it. We have worked through many challenges in our history, and slavery and racism are among them. However, one of the hallmarks of the United States is that it is a nation where the overwhelming majority of its citizens treat one another as equals, based, as Martin Luther King Jr. said, on the content of our character, not on the color of our skin. The real issue dividing our nation today is between those who love God and seek to live according to his word and do his will and those who are trying to remove God from every aspect of culture. The pillars of virtue, morality, and religion, meaning a genuine relationship with God, are being lost to a mob mentality of anything goes. What will it take to heal our nation? That's my topic for this morning. I want to take you back to the Old Testament today, to 2 Chronicles 7.14. These are the words that the Lord shared with King Solomon when the temple in Jerusalem was finally finished, one of the most beautiful structures the world had ever seen. But the Lord said, If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. You see, the Lord our God was less impressed with this beautiful temple and more concerned about the nature of people's hearts. This is what I would call one of the divine ifs in the Bible. When you see this small little word in Scripture, it means that there is a condition attached. For example, look at the ifs in this passage from 1 John chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to purify us 
from all unrighteousness. You all know that God's love is a free gift. That forgiveness is a free gift. That salvation is a free gift. But like I said last week, our personal choices can create significant barriers to God's blessing. We see it here. If we intentionally choose the darkness over the light of Christ, we won't be blessed. If we deny the reality of sin in our own lives, we are simply deceived and will bear the rotten fruit of our bad choices. So look again at 2 Chronicles 7.14 and notice that big if. Let's read it together this time. God says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and will heal their land. You see, these words were spoken in effect to the nation of Israel, but they speak to every nation and every generation. We need revival. We need spiritual transformation. We need healing in America and in the world. From, but it only comes from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. God is saying, I need more. I need more than temples. I need more than sanctuaries. I need you. This verse is a particular message for those of us who are already believers. It says, if my people who are called by my name. What an amazing gift to be called the people of God. And today to be identified as Christians, as Christ followers. Of all the titles we could have, this is the best. We've been chosen to represent the Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to a world that is desperate for healing. We've been sent as light in the darkness. We've been commissioned as ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us, the Bible says. You see, as Christians, we are God's reputation. Just think about it. For many people, the only thing they may ever know about Jesus is what they see in you. I love 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, which says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. Say that last line with me. And that is what we are. If you are a follower of Christ, then that is what you are, a child of God. And nothing can ever take that away from you. But what are you doing with this gift? Are you representing Jesus well? As I said, our actions often speak louder than our words. If we say one thing and do another, we create a barrier of deception between us and God that also impacts our witness to the world and the healing that God wants to bring to this nation. In our text, we see that if God's people will do four specific things, God will respond in three specific ways. Fascinating verse. I believe that this giant if is just as applicable to our circumstances today as when these words were first written. Look at the screen. First, we are called what are, what are we called to do? We're called to humble ourselves. Do you see it there? Next, we're called to pray. Next, we're called to seek God's face. And next, we're called to turn from our wicked ways. And what does God promise to do in response to these sincere actions? He says that he will hear from heaven. He will forgive our sin and he will heal our land. Let's take a few minutes this morning to just uh, kind of have a window into the significance of these requirements and promises and what they mean for our nation. First, our call to action must begin with humility. We are called to humble ourselves. If my people who are called by my name will humble 
themselves. You see, humility is the opposite of pride. In Proverbs 16, 18, it says, Pride goes before destruction. The old King James is, Pride goeth before a fall, or was it cometh? I forget, you know, that's kind of hard to remember that stuff. Pride says, I do not need God. I can make my own way. I know best. I call the shots in my life. The issue of pride becomes a devastating roadblock to God's blessings in our personal lives, in our churches, and in our country. Don't you hate it when you're in a hurry to get somewhere and you run into a roadblock? (laughs) Especially like here in Elk River right now, or maybe we'd say all over Minnesota right now. I mean, it inconveniences you with time, and, and we often fall short on patience when that happens. Well, God hates roadblocks too, the kind we all throw up to hold God at arm's length. Pride doesn't listen. Pride isn't thankful. It wants to be noticed. Pride loves to talk about itself more than the Lord. It won't be corrected. Pride thinks of its own needs first. It's always trying to make itself look better by putting other people down. Listen to this passage from James 4, verses 1 through 6. Think about your personal life and think about our nation as I read this. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but do not have, so you kill sometimes with our words. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think Scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? But he gives us more grace. That is why the Scripture says God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Humility is God's antidote to pride. We will never confess, let alone recognize our sins, until we humble ourselves before God. This story took place in a great art palace in Copenhagen, Denmark, and maybe it caught my attention because I'm half Danish on my dad's side. A woman was down on her knees washing and scrubbing the marble floor beneath a beautiful statue of Jesus with his arms outstretched like this. A visitor standing in front of the statue said, you know, I just don't see the beauty in this statue that everybody raves about. I'm just not as impressed as I thought I would be. The washer lady looked up from scrubbing the floor and said, get down on your knees and look at it. How long has it been since you've been down on your knees looking up at Jesus. Friends, humility is the first step toward healing for us and for our nation. Prayer is the next. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, only when we humble ourselves before God and recognize our need will our prayers really become effective. Too many of our prayers today are anemic, formal, and even repetitious. All too often we only pray in a time of crisis when we roll out our wish list as though God was some kind of Santa Claus or genie in a bottle. James 5.15 says, The prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. How about a sick nation? You see, we can pray and not have revival. But the fact is that revival will never come without the sincere, fervent, and even desperate prayers of God's people. 
Prayer looks to God and says, I can't, but you can. Prayer acknowledges our profound dependence on the Lord, and even the prayers of one person can change the life of another, of a family, of a church, of a community, of a nation. Dwight L. Moody became a famous uh, American evangelist in the second half of the 1800s. Why? Because he loved Jesus. He believed in the power of prayer, the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ to change people's lives. One of his famous quotes was, faith makes all things possible, love makes all things easy. Well, one time he went on vacation to England. He was on a sort of sabbatical to get refreshed and have time alone with God, sort of like what I look forward to when I go on vacation. He wasn't planning to preach, but he met a pastor in England who knew who he was and prevailed on him to come and speak at his church that Sunday. Well, that Sunday afternoon, Dwight Moody wrote in his journal that they were the deadest crowd he had ever seen And that the only thing worse than preaching to those people was that for some reason he had promised to go back the next night to preach again. But when he went back on Monday night, something shifted in the spirit about halfway through his message. The people started coming to life. And he felt compelled to ask if if anyone there would like to become a Christian. And a lot of people stood up. He was so surprised that he said, Maybe you don't understand what I'm asking. Pray about it some more. And if you really are serious about committing your life to Jesus, come over to this little room off the side of the sanctuary after the service is over, and I'll meet you there. Well, when the service was over, he went to the room, and it was packed. Moody said to the pastor, Have you ever seen anything like this before? The pastor said, No. But I think you need to preach again tomorrow night. (laughs) So much for his vacation. Dwight Moody preached 10 straight days, and more than 400 people in this little church gave their lives to Christ. Revival had broken out, and in the months ahead, it lit a fire all across England. Moody couldn't understand. These people were dead, and something had changed. He later came to find out that an 80-year-old widow named Mary Ann Adelaide had read one of his sermons in an American newspaper, had developed a heart for revival in her church and city and nation, and had prayed every day for months that Dwight L. Moody would come and preach at her church. God answers prayer. Friends, sometime today, on this 4th of July, I want you to get down on your knees and call out to God in prayer for the United States of America. The revival of virtue, morals, and genuine faith will only begin when we humble ourselves and pray. The next if in our text is to seek God's face. You see it there. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. What does that mean? That's an interesting phrase because in the Old Testament it was believed that no one could look upon the face of God and live to tell about it. The glory of God was so strong on Moses, for example, when he came down from the mountain with the Ten Commandments that the people had to look away. Parents, have you ever been disciplining your kids, trying to get them to listen and said, look at me while I'm talking to you, and not always with a smile on your face? Well, I think that this is the request that God is making of us. He wants to have our complete attention. Even if we need some discipline, he wants us to look into our eyes, for there we will see his love. To seek means to Search out by any method, especially by worship and prayer. The word face refers to God's countenance, his essence. Well, this little phrase is a call to the people of God to stop looking for guidance from all the wrong places. Your wisest friend 
isn't the answer. Money isn't the answer. Possessions aren't the answer. The government isn't the answer. God is the answer to all our needs. But we must seek him with all our heart. Revival will only come to this nation when its people, even a faithful remnant, seek the face of God. Look at Isaiah 55, verse 6. It says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. And then James 4, 8 says, Draw near to God. And what's the rest? He will draw near to you. What a great promise. You see, when the will of God becomes our first priority in life, the things he cares about will become the things we care about. The things that get his attention will become the things that get our attention. You know what your real priorities are today? Well, if you'd like to know, ask yourself these three simple questions. Number one, on what activity do I spend most of my time? Number two, on what do I spend most of my money? And number three, on what do I focus most of my thought? You answer those three questions, and God will reveal to you what your true priorities are. You see, misplaced priorities are the real enemy of seeking God's face and consequently his will for your life. Look all around us today. Misplaced priorities are causing us as a nation to miss out on the revival and the healing that God wants to bring to us. There's that beautiful praise chorus that says it so well. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Let's sing that together. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Beautiful. And then the fourth if is that we would turn from our wicked ways. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Remember a few weeks ago when I said that that word wretch in the hymn Amazing Grace kind of makes us uncomfortable? Well, so does the word wicked. <laughs> there may have been a famous Broadway musical by that name, but we don't like it when it's applied to us. Our reluctance to acknowledge our own wicked ways is the result, really, of comparing ourselves to others. Most of the time, we can rationalize that we're really not such bad people after all. We'll let the Teen Challenge clients next week tell their testimonies and marvel at just how fa far a, a life can fall, but sit in those same chairs uh, patting ourselves on the back for not being anything like that. Here's the problem, though. Our denial keeps us from God's blessing. Look at Isaiah 59, verse 2. It says, But your iniquities have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Did you know that your sin can actually keep God from hearing your prayers? That's pretty serious stuff. Unless we acknowledge our sin and brokenness before God and repent of it and change our ways, we remain separated from God. His face is hidden from us. Look at the sin that's holding our nation in bondage today. We want to raise more money for our various projects, so we legalize gambling. We want to prevent teen pregnancy, so we hand out free birth control or open more abortion clinics. We don't want anyone to feel judged, so we endorse gay marriage and agree that there now must be at least 21 different genders. We legalize drugs like marijuana and barbiturates and allow even worse drugs to continue to pour across our border. 
in our major cities, including Minneapolis, our children and teens are killing each other, and we refuse to acknowledge the root causes. Major portions of the Christian church today are not only agreeing with these policy positions, but openly endorsing them. Friends, the heart of God must be grieved. We are saved by grace, but grace is never a license to sin. What we need in America is a season of repentance and coming back to God. That's the only way that healing will come. To repent is to turn around and come back to those foundations of virtue, morals, and faith upon which this nation was founded. Instead, it seems we are marching headlong toward a godless society. That's why God says if. That's why God says if. We need revival, but revival will not come to a presumptuous people. It will only come to those who get honest about their sin, who confess them, forsake them, and turn to God with all their hearts. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Yes, the if of this statement in 2 Chronicles 7, 14 is followed by an amazing promise. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, read the rest with me, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins, and I will heal their land. Praise God. This is revival. God hearing. God forgiving. God healing. To heal means to stitch back together to repair thoroughly. This is what is desperately needed in our families, in our churches, in our communities, in our nation, all races, all backgrounds. We need to be stitched back together and thoroughly repaired as only God can do. As if prophetic, Thomas Jefferson, the third president of the United States, and the drafter and one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence wrote, God, who gave us life, gave us liberty. And can the liberties of a nation be thought secure when we have removed their only firm basis? A conviction in the minds of the people that these liberties are a gift from God. That they are not to be violated but with his wrath. Indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just, that his justice cannot sleep forever. Friends, it's time to wake up a sleeping church. It's time to wake up a sleeping nation. We, the people, those who are both citizens of this kingdom and of the kingdom of heaven, have both the duty and privilege of calling upon God to bring healing to this nation. On this 4th of July, in the year 2021, I pray that we will rise up and answer that call. When we do, our God has promised to hear our prayers, forgive our sins, and heal our great land. Let's stand and pray. Well, dear God, when we think back on our nation's history, we know that there were fervent believers who came to this country seeking religious freedom and opportunity and, and Lord, to pattern a government, to pattern a nation after biblical principles. We also know how far short we have fallen in so many of the years of our existence. But, Lord, we've We've done our best to make amends for those sins. And we call upon you again today to forgive us for the sins of the past and the present, Lord, and to lead us forward as a nation into a, a better future, a bright future. And Lord, a, a transformed nation is one where 
the people of that nation demonstrate every day the love, the peace, the joy, the kindness of God. The very character qualities that make you our great God are the qualities that we want to see in this country, the United States of America. And so, Lord, we, we prophetically get down on our knees right now. Let's just do that together as you're able. And, Lord, we lift up our prayers, each of us silently for a few moments, for this country that we love. We cry out to you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Forgive our sins and bring healing to this land. In Jesus' name, amen.